All right, if you could open up in your Bibles to John chapter 3. You might be familiar with some of these scriptures in this, in this chapter. But John chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 5 through 21. John 3, 5 through 21. This is Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, but who I think knew that Jesus was from God, and so he had him questions. He had questions to ask of him, and this is where God, or Jesus, reveals his mission on earth, and the mission that we have come to understand and and to use as a memory verse for for years gone by, uh, John three sixteen. But let's start with verse five. It says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, he must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify we have, that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved or discovered. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God." We were watching a, a movie last week. It was a series. And in that series, Jesus is uh, gathering his disciples. He's gathering his apostles. Disciples, many are following him. And the people that he picks out to follow him are just kind of strange. You know, if you think about who he picked out, you know, you have the Pharisees and they have pedigrees and they have uh, doctorates. They have, uh, there are, a lot of them are lawyers. They're experts in law and matters of the law. And, and they seem like they would be people that are picked out from Jesus, you know, to follow him. But here he is, he's picking out these, these ragtag people, the people that were down and out, the people that dwelled in places where Pharisees did not go. Um, and in, in the midst of all, all of this, these things that he's doing and the people that he's calling, he, 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 he meets each one of them individually, and he speaks to their hearts. And out of this whole world and, and the, the stature of the world and, and the, the class system that the world has and still has today, he chooses from the lowly. He chooses from the lower class, and he looks at them in their hearts, and he says to them, follow me, follow me. And the word follow me or the phrase follow me, it really has some connotations to it. What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean that he came and died for us? What does it mean that he, God gave his son for us? He looks at Matthew, and what really, really hit me last week was the fact that he looked at Matthew, and Matthew was wealthy, but he was despised. He was a tax collector. He was somebody that when he, they, people saw him coming, they would hide, they would spit on him, they would do everything they could because they knew that he took advantage of them that he collected taxes, more than the taxes even allowed, just to pad and line his own pockets. And so you would think someone like that, Jesus would not call. But in the weirdness and in the 
unscrupulous choices that Jesus seems to make, and sometimes we don't really agree with those, I don't think, or we think, Jesus, what are you doing? You know, kind of like Peter may have done. But he does, he calls these outcasts. He calls these people that you wonder, why would you call them? But then we look at ourselves and we say, wait a minute, why would you call me? Why would you call me? And that's the beauty of Jesus calling out to us and saying, follow me, because we don't deserve for him to call us. We don't deserve for him to look at us and with everything that we've done and everything that we are, for him to look at us in our hearts. Because when Jesus looks at you, he doesn't just look in your eyes, he doesn't just look at you, he looks through you and he sees who you are. And so as he's looking at us with everything that he knows, because he knows everything, he still looks at us and says, follow me, follow me. In our rejection, in our status as outcasts, in our status as adulterers, drunkards, drug addicts, whatever we were, he calls us and he says, follow me, follow me. And so what's the response when Jesus would call you and say, follow me? Do we say, you know, no, you know, not now, Jesus. You know, I've got more important things to do. Do you understand I've got a job? Do you understand that I've got responsibilities? Do you understand that I still want my sin? Do you understand that I still want my status as an outcast? Because I don't know about you, but when he called me, I was an addict. I was a pornographer. I was a liar. I was a cheat. I was everything that you could look up in the dictionary and find somebody wrong to be. But in the midst of my wrongness, he looked at me and called to me and said, follow me. Do you allow your wrongness to answer the call to follow him? Because he calls to you today. He looks at you today and he says, you know, despite everything you are, I love you and I'm calling you to follow me. Do we say, well, just a second, Jesus. Hang on a minute. I got to do some stuff first. Or do we just throw everything down and say, Lord, I can't believe you called me. And if you called me and you love me, Father, I'm letting everything go. And I'm putting everything in the call that you've given to me. It's like that parable he says. He says, the kingdom of God is like a field. That when someone knew the riches therein, they went and they sold everything and they bought that field because they knew that field was the, the thing that they needed. It was given. It was the, the field in, with, the, with the treasure within it. You know? And they sold everything for that field. That I don't need anything else because this field is my salvation. Have we answered that call and said, Lord, you have called me. I've given up everything because you are it. You're it. Do we understand that we're following the Son of God? Do you understand the Son of God is calling to you? The Son of God's calling to you. And, and in that call, we understand that He is God. And we understand that He represents everything God is. In John 3.16, 3, it starts out like this. It says, for God. And when we read about Jesus in His earthly ministry, we see that He taught us that He was in line with the Father. That He knew the Father. He knew He existed. That, and, and not only did God exist, but He showed us everything that God was in Himself. Because many times you think, well, God's angry. God's mad at me. God is certainly upset because I made this mistake and that mistake. And, and, but, but no, he, He's not doing that. He looks at us. And what we see in Jesus when we look back is we see everything that God is. All the love that God is. All the forgiveness that God is. All the relation that God is to us. He said everything in this world is related to God. In some way, God has created everything. And He created it for Himself. But God, Jesus gave us reasons to believe in a God who loves us. And one of the best ways He showed us was He showed us God in all His purity, all His goodness, and it was displayed in his life. So you could say, I believe in God because Jesus represents who God is. And all that I know of Jesus makes me want to trust God more than any philosopher, more than any scientist, more than any theologian, more than any friend. You know, one, one day I realized that I had so many hang-ups 
And I came to the conclusion that I believed National Geographic, Channel 5 News, some scientists, more than I believed the Word of God. And so many times we get hung up with our beliefs because we've heard it on TV, and we take it as they must be the experts, they must be, they're, man, they're knowledgeable. And I let that belief of what they said override my belief in what Jesus Christ said. But Jesus Christ is everything that's true. And we can easily trust God because Jesus showed us who God is in the display of his life and the fact that he loves us. Like Who else loves you like Jesus Christ does? Who else loves you like Jesus Christ does? Who else takes you in your brokenness, in your rejection, in the fact that you didn't add up to some group or another group, who else takes you and loves you like Jesus Christ does? No one. No one. So I can say to myself, this God is trustworthy. This God is trustworthy. I believe in God. I believe in God because Jesus Christ is God, and everything that Jesus Christ is is what I want in my life more than anything else who's better qualified who's who's more trustworthy than Jesus Christ who's able to teach us about God more than Jesus the answer is no one we have the ability to have a conscience we have a, a, an ability to have a sense of justice we have an ability to contemplate spiritual things we have an ability to love all because God in the form of Jesus Christ called to us and said follow me follow me. You know, we have no capacity to love without God. We don't. We don't we, so we think we do. Everyone thinks they do in the world that they have loved and they have loves in their life, but they truly don't have love without God because only God is love. But we are created in, in his image. He was first and he is last. He made us for himself and he made us like himself. And he made us for the sole purpose that he would be made known through us. And we think, what's our mission on this earth? What am I supposed to do? You know, I believe in Christ. I joined the church. What am I going to do now? Make Jesus Christ known through you. Make Jesus Christ known through you. Meaning in our lives is found in God in our lives and Jesus Christ coming through in our lives. We serve in the church because we, in the church, represent Jesus Christ. We allow Jesus Christ to live through us, to be displayed through us. And when we do it together, we're doing it in the spirit of Christ that he's designated for a people in fellowship. Isaiah 43, 7, it says, Even everyone that is called by my name, I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, formed him. <clears throat> yea, I have made him. We follow Jesus Christ because he is God. We follow Jesus Christ because he is God. The second thing, we follow Jesus Christ because he's God's son, because he's God's son. And so the verse goes on, we know this verse, for God so loved the world, and then it goes on that he gave his only begotten son. And so Jesus taught that God has one begotten son. And in some religions, this is blasphemy to say this, that God is, or that Jesus is God's son. And even when Jesus came and the Israelites and the Pharisees were listening to Jesus and he said, he, he proclaimed himself as the son of God, they called out blasphemy, that this is wrong. And, and that, was his, <clears throat> that was his reason for crucifixion and for death because he claimed to be the son of God. But what we need to understand is he only has one begotten son. What does it mean that Jesus is the only begotten son? It doesn't mean that he's like us in any way because we're also called the sons of God, but only because we're adopted into the family of God by being joined to Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. But Romans 8, 14 says this is for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So we are proclaimed if we believe in Christ, the sons of God, but that's not what Jesus is. He's not made. He's not adopted. He's not grafted. He's not like the angels even, who are also called the sons of God. But Jesus is a son by being begotten. And begetting something is really, it's beyond our comprehension because it's even more than birth. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, rabbits beget rabbits, horses beget horses, humans beget humans, 
not statues or portraits, and God begets God, not humans or angels. So God's only, God's only begotten Son is God. God begets God. And so there was never a time when God had never begotten His Son. He's eternally been with the Father. He's always existed. And that's why John 1.1 1, 1 says this. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in John 1.14 it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus has always been with God. He just entered the world in the flesh. So he is fully God. And it's important to understand that because of what that means to our salvation. It is specific to our belief because without Jesus being God, we wouldn't have salvation. But Jesus is God, and he manifested himself on this earth in the flesh, died on the cross. We had God dying on the cross for you and me, for God so loved the world. And many religions want to deny the deity of Christ. But if we lost the deity of Christ, we lose the salvation of Christ as well. But God loves through His Son. For God so loved, Jesus showed us God, and He showed us this God that loves. And if you said nothing else, you could say this about God, that He loves. 1 John 4, 8, it says this. It says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And John Piper said this about this verse. He said, God's love says this, that giving what's good and serving the benefit of others is closer to the essence of God than getting and being served. God loves and God is love. Giving what's good and serving the benefit of others is closer to the essence of God than getting it and being served. How, why sometimes do we think that God isn't good and his mission isn't to serve the benefit of others because that's what he did in our case. He served us. He died for us. He loves us so much. And we really can't comprehend that kind of love. Jesus says in, in John 3, 16, God so loved. And when he says this, he's, he's not saying how much God loved, but what he's saying, it's not an amount, but what he's saying is it's like this. He's saying God loved like this. He's given an example. God loved like this, that he gave up his only son. It's not God loved the world so much, but it's God so loved the world that he did this, that he gave up Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, the one son that he was one in spirit with. He allowed to be separated for a time, to die in our place, and to be rejected, to suffer bitterness, to suffer death, and to come into this world. John 1, 11, it says, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. And instead of receiving Him, they killed Him. But God knew it was going to happen that way. In John 17, 4, Jesus facing death, He says this, knowing His mission had been accomplished, He says, I have glorified Thee on the earth. I have finished the work which Thou gavest Me to do. And it's that kind of love that God has for us. That sacrificial love, it's a giving love. And it, he gives us his most valuable possession, and that is his own son. It was a love that cost him, but that's how much he loves us. He gave us, he gave up his most valuable treasure, his own son. He even gave himself. It's costly, it's powerful, it's painful. And who he gave it for is unimaginable. He gave it to wretches like us. He gave it for the world. God so loved the world. God so loved this rebellious, murderous, contemptuous, lying world that he gave his own son. Romans 5, 7, and 8, it says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So even in the condition that we are in, even in the state we are in, God was willing to give up everything for us. How do, you, how do you wrap your mind around a love like that? Because I think the reality is, is we can't. We try. We try to get it. We try to understand that God loves us this much, that he gave up the most valuable thing to him. 
How many of us would give up the most valuable thing? How, much, how many of us would say to our son or daughter, I'm sorry, you, you got to die because I love these people so much. Think about what heart-wrenching action that would be on our part. Your, 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 your children are everything, or they should be. And you look at them and you see yourself in them and you think, wow, this is a miracle. This is a miracle that I've got my own son, I've got my own daughter. And, and you, you, you take so much time in them and you raise them up and you, you see everything about them and, and you realize that you see yourself in them because they came directly from you. And it melts your heart at times. Even when you're angry, you're still melted in your heart. And the last thing we could comprehend is to slaughter one of them for the sake of someone else. But God did that for us. He allowed His Son to be slaughtered for the sake of a rebellious world. Of a rebellious world. We would dare do that for someone who was good with our own kid, but God did it for a world that was no good. John 3, 14 and 15, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man will be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. And the history and the example of the Israelites, we talked about this a little last week, they were afflicted by this poison of the serpent. They had rebelled against God. They had started to curse the manna that He had given them, the, the, the substance that He had provided for them in the desert. And the punishment was that, was that He sent serpents among them. And they bit the people. They were poisoned. And there was only one hope of salvation. Moses crafted this brass snake. And he puts it on a pole. And many believe that the pole looked like a cross. And if they were to look up at the pole, if they were to look up at the cross with that bronze serpent, that they would escape death. That there was nothing they could do in themselves because surely without any intervening from God, they were going to die from the snake bite. But Moses crafted this serpent and he said, if anyone looks on the serpent and has faith in it, they'll be saved. And so many did. And many were healed of poison. They were healed of death. They were healed of the process of dying after they were bit. And in the example to us, the point is that we can't look to ourselves. We cannot look to ourselves. But in our condition, if we look to Christ, He gives us salvation. And, and, and the example for us is, is not to look once and to let our eyes down, but to look every day, every minute, every hour, to look on Christ and to realize the fact that we can't do it ourselves, and we never will. But we have this great salvation in the Son of God who died for us, undeserving, unworthy, but He was worthy. We were worthless, but He was worth everything. And now, in our worthlessness, we find our worth in Him. And what's so beautiful about our worthlessness is everyone is in the same worthlessness. And from our worthlessness, we look up at Christ and we say, wait a minute, there's beauty in the Son of God. And I no longer have to dwell in my worthlessness, but His worth has become my worth. And now I find my worth in Him alone. My worth is in Christ. Nothing compares to the love of God. Nothing compares to the love of God. It is a love that brings joy. It is a love that brings real life. And so Jesus is calling to you today. In His love, in His salvation, in the only way out. He calls to you today and He's saying this. He's saying, follow me. Follow me. Will you leave everything behind? Will you put all your eggs in one basket and say, God, you have given me life. You have given me salvation. Now my life deserves to be given to you. Will you leave everything behind and follow Him? What would you change in your life if you did this? Is the Son of God worth it? Is the Son of God worth it? To leave everything behind and say, Lord, I am following you. Whatever you ask me to do, whatever direction you want me to go, whatever you want me to throw down, Lord, my life is yours because you have given me salvation and you deserve it. Will you pray with me? Lord, we love you. 
Father, and we thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, that you have made a way where there was no way. Father, and many times in this world, we come to a place where we feel hopeless and helpless, and I think you've designed it that way. Father, you designed it that we can't find our way out. Father, that we can't fix it with a doctor. We can't fix it with a psychologist. We can't fix it with a Band-Aid, Father. We can't fix it with self-will. But Lord, you stand before us like a serpent on the cross and you say, look upon me because I can fix it. Because I can make the way. Because I can heal. Because I can do all things. Because I can save. Father, let us come to a place of understanding that we have no way out but you. And Lord, at first it seems hopeless and helpless, and it seems like we don't want to be at that point because it means we have to admit our weakness. But Lord, you wait on our weakness. And yet in our weakness, you look at us and you say, look upon me and let me be your strength. And then you look on us again, Lord, and you say, with all the sincerity of your heart, as you're looking into our eyes and bearing deep down in our hearts, Lord, you say, follow me me follow me father help us to follow you help us to leave everything else behind father with a new mission in our lives to follow you and to do the work that you would have us to do father what would our lives look like what would be different what would be changed what relationships would be healed what things would take place lord if we just decided we are following you we are answering the call that you have made in our lives. Lord, even the young people in here today, Lord, maybe you're speaking to their hearts. And Father, maybe they've had ideas of what they want their lives to be, Lord, but you're calling to them even today. And you're looking in their eyes and you're saying, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me and I'll give you greater worth. Follow me and I'll glorify myself in you. Father, I pray that you would astound us with what we see in these young people that you've called to yourself. And Father, we want to be astounded with what you do with us, Lord. Help us to follow you, Lord. Lord, we give you praise, and we thank you, Lord, for the hope you've given to us. Lord, in this Advent season, in the season where we're preparing to celebrate the fact that you came to this earth, Father, help us to dwell in hope, knowing that it's not a blind hope, Lord, but it's a, it's a hope that's fulfilled in, the, in Jesus Christ that lives inside of us. If there's one who hasn't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'll tell you, He is your only way out. But He loves you immensely, fondly, greatly. He's ready to wrap His arms around you. When others have rejected you, have rebuffed you, have slapped you, have hit you, have, have cursed you, have done whatever they've done. It wasn't him that did those things. And today he stands before you and he says, I love you with an everlasting love. If there's one in this building that hasn't accepted him, maybe today's your day. Just say this with me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Forgive me of all the wrong I've done, Lord. Father, I need you to save me from my sin. Accept me as your own. Come into my heart. Change me, Lord, from the inside out. I claim you as the Son of God, as my Savior. I believe that you rose from the dead and that you're seated on the right hand of God the Father. I accept you as my Savior. For it's in Jesus' name. Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for your love. We praise you. Let us go with this love. Let us spread this love. Let us follow you to the ends of the earth, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.